In the second half of December, there was a lot of speculation about whether the transition period would end with a deal or without a deal. There were many people who thought there would be no deal, both because of pressure from the extreme wing of the Conservative Party and because of Boris Johnson's personal views. In the event, on the 24th of December, uh, the President of the European Commission and Boris Johnson did announce that a, a deal had been agreed, uh, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, which would prevent the imposition of, of quotas and, and tariffs. Uh, there was a startling contrast between the tone in, in which both these leaders introduced the agreement. Um, Boris Johnson regarded it as a great triumph. Um, the President of the European Commission was much more uh, cautious and prudent in her welcome for it. Um, I think her views are more realistic. Uh, but the leaving of the C C customs union and the single market can only cause economic damage both to the United Kingdom uh, and to the European Union. Uh, and I think that um, the president of the European Com Commission um, did well to recognize that fact. When you look, however, at the details of the, um, of the agreement, you'll see that the people who say there wouldn't be an agreement weren't entirely wrong. It's a very thin and patchy agreement. Uh, it contains very little on services, which constitute 80% of the British economy, and negotiations will continue on such uh, important issues as financial services, um, uh, the protection of, of data, uh, fisheries, uh, the return of non-EU citizens, um, and professional qualifications. Uh, much of the implementation of the Irish protocol still hasn't been nailed down. Uh, and there's in four years the prospect uh, of another vote on the Irish protocol, uh, which in theory could overturn this protocol, unlikely though that is. Uh, a whole raft of committees have been set up to deal with the loose ends left by this hastily uh, agreed and negotiated agreement. Um, either side can renounce the agreement of one, with one year's notification, and there's a, a five-year review clause. So in no sense can this be regarded as the definitive statement on the future of EU-UK relations. But apart from the individual issues that I've already mentioned, there's an overarching issue which brings out the provisionality and transitional nature um, of this agreement. Uh, that's the question of the level playing field. As most of you know, the level playing field was a, a concept um, of much uh, importance to the European Union. They were afraid that the United Kingdom, if it were given access, quota free and tariff free access to the single market, the European single market, um, would abuse that position by introducing uh, what they, you would call disloyal competition. Um, that's to say, um, relaxing and lowering standards and environmental issues, social issues, competition issues. Uh, and that might be used to the disadvantage of producers and service providers within the European Union. The agreement is designed to make that much more difficult for the United Kingdom. Uh, it will be possible for the United Kingdom to deviate from existing European standards, but if so, there will be uh, immediate capacity on the part of the EU for retaliation. And uh, that retaliation could be either subsidy, uh, either um, new tariffs, um, or the suspension of elements within the, e within the treaty, uh, which are favorable to, to the United Kingdom. Different views exist on how often these provisions will, will be invoked. Some people think that Boris Johnson will be under a great deal of pressure um, to make provocative and polemical um, rows uh, appear between the EU and the UK. Uh, others think um, that it will be to this interest of both sides that friction should be muted. Um, the position is profoundly ambiguous. And that's an ambiguity that goes back, in fact, to the um, referendum, uh, when different people had completely different views of the implications of Brexit, which they probably supported, um, in order to define Britain's future position in the world. There were some who were voting for Brexit who wanted uh, Britain to have as little as possible to do with Europe and the European Union. Um, others wanted um, a, a close relationship with the European Union, um, but didn't want to be part of the political structures of the EU. And that uh, contradiction was never resolved during the referendum. Um, and indeed, it was in the interests of the people voting for Brexit or people running the campaign for Brexit that it shouldn't be resolved. Um, they wanted to ensure that the maximum number of people voted for Brexit. 
even if they were voting for different kinds of Brexit. Obviously, within the, um, the um, implementation of the agreement over the next five years, um, the internal management of the Conservative Party will be key. It was surprising to many people how docile and how accepting of this new agreement were the ERG, uh, the most um, Eurosceptic element within the Conservative Party. Um, they, however, stressed in their press release accepting the agreement that they expected to see it robustly implemented, as they put it. Um, and that seems to me to be code for an encouragement to Boris Johnson or his possible successor um, to implement the agreement um, in as minimalist and as, as uncooperative a way as possible. Um, on the other hand, I'm sure there will be pressures from the economy and from business uh, for a more harmonious, a uh, more consensual approach. Um, we simply don't know what's going to happen. For people like me who want to rejoin the European Union as soon as possible, it's obviously of interest um, that there should be um, as close um, and harmonious relations between the EU and the UK as possible. Um, there is a view which is sometimes put forward that now that the um, Brexit deal is finally done, people like myself uh, have no right to agitate and to advocate uh, for uh, rejoining the European Union. Um, that seems to me an extraordinary proposition. Um, we don't think that there is a way of making a success of Brexit. We think the Brexit will cause not merely enormous economic damage, um, but constitutional damage as well. Um, the position of, of Ireland and Scotland uh, is, is thrown into instability precisely by Brexit. Uh, and the fact, the idea that we shouldn't draw attention to these problems of Brexit and suggest a way of sol solving them um, seems to me profoundly unpatriotic um, and undemocratic. Um, it's like um, saying that as the Titanic uh, gets nearer and nearer to the iceberg, no one should point out this um, problem that's uh, facing the voyagers uh, for fear uh, of embarrassing the cat. Unfortunately, the leader of the opposition, Labour Party leader, Keir Starmer, um, has been unwilling um, to talk about the implications of the damage that Brexit is going to do. He's been willing enough to complain about the agreement, um, but unnecessarily he urged, he instructed his MPs to vote for the Johnson deal. That's something that has caused a, a lot of offence among people who might otherwise have been his normal, normal supporters. He's hoping, I think, that over the next few years, and perhaps even at the next general election, Europe will never be an issue or will be an issue that it's possible simply to ignore. I think that's a miscalculation. I think there will be interests within the Conservative Party that will want to um, generate um, partisan and populist friction with the European Union over the coming years. And if John, if um, Starmer can't participate in these debates, um, he'll look weak and ineffectual. Um, I'm sure that um, uh, after his first uh, reaction of caution, he will understand that it's in his interest and in the interests of most of his supporters um, that he should participate fully in these debates. Uh, it's uh, understandable that the, the Prime Minister should have wanted to present this deal uh, in the most um, favourable possible light. He has, I'm afraid, a reputation for over-promising and under-delivering. And it may well be that this is a, another instance of that. If the more we look at the, um, at the agreement, um, the more we see it, its failings uh, and inadequacies. Indeed, it reminds me a, a little bit of the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland, an animal that appeared and reappeared and disappeared. And when it disappeared, its whiskers disappeared, its cheeks disappeared, its mouth disappeared, but all that was left at the end was the grin. Something like that, uh, I think, is true of the, um, of the agreement, of the uh, agreement that uh, Boris Johnson has just signed. Indeed, future historians may conclude that the Cheshire Cat analogy applies to the whole um, of the premiership of Boris Johnson. That when you look at the details, they start to fade into unreality and forgetfulness. Um, but the one uh, long lasting legacy of his premiership um, is the Prime Minister's grin and nothing more.